Hello. Hello. We're starting right at 2.15? All right, we'll get started here in about one more minute. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo están todos? Bien? Great. For those of you who don't speak Spanish, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good. All right. Sounds like we're on the same page. Um, hope everybody had a good lunch. Ho hopefully not too big of a lunch, though. I don't want everybody to take a siesta here while I'm uh, talking about some, some interesting things here. Uh, my name's Jared Smith. I've been in the Drupal community for a long, long time. Uh, helping out in a, in a number of different things. I um, wanted to give a talk today about uh, Docker and specifically how we use Docker in the, in the new Drupal CI um, test infrastructure. Um, before I get started, though, I want to talk a little bit about uh, photography because I, I'm an amateur photographer. I don't uh, claim to be that good, but I have fun with it. It's, it's cheaper than a, hiring a therapist. Um, and in the world of photography, there's a saying that says that the amateurs worry about gear and professionals worry about money, and masters worry about light. And so in, in my talk today, um, my goal is to shed a little bit of light on the topic of, uh, of Docker and then, and then Docker's interaction with the Drupal CI test infrastructure. Um, I don't claim to be an expert, but I have been around uh, the block a few times, and hopefully I can share some of the knowledge and light I've, I've found with you guys here today. Um, I do like an interactive presentation, so if you have questions, raise your hand. If, if, things, if you're following along and things are making sense, nod your head up and down like this. Everybody practice, up and down. If things aren't making sense or if you have a question, shake your head side to side like this. That lets me know that, that I need to you know, rephrase uh, something or, or say it another way or go into another explanation. Um, it also just lets me know that not everybody's asleep. So that, that's good. I do, I, I, do like a, I do like lots of feedback. So please feel welcome to, to interrupt me with questions or comments or complaints or suggestions. Or if you know this stuff better than me, stand up and, 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 and teach me something. That's okay, too. We're all here to learn, right? Okay, so quickly, a rough agenda for what I want to cover today. I want to talk about a quick history lesson, um, talk about what is Docker, how does it work, and then dive into the, into the Drupal CI stuff figure out why, why is Drupal CI using Docker, how are they using it, and then talk about some of the warnings and pitfalls and gotchas of, of Docker because it's not all there yet, but it's still kind of fun stuff. So let's, let's go through that in kind of roughly that order. But like I said, I want to start out with a history lesson. Let's say you wanted to go sailing on a ship. Since we're so close to the ocean here and Barcelona is such a beautiful city, let's go sailing. What are we going to need? A boat. Okay, we've got a boat. Here's our boat. What else do we need? We're going we're gonna to sail to Boston. How long is that going to take us? Two weeks, three weeks, six months. On a boat like that, it's going to take a while. So we need maps. What else do we need? Wind. Wind. Some, did, I say, did somebody say food? Yeah. Food? We need food, right? So how are we going to get that food on the ship? Well, 
You're going to wheel a bunch of stuff up to the ship and you're just going to throw it over and some of it's going to be in bags. Some of it might be in barrels. I, that's probably not wine, but that may be whiskey. I don't know. We'll see. Now, some of it may be just wrapped in canvas. And apologies for to, to any vegetarians in the room for this next slide. I'm sorry. Some of it may not be in containers at all. That's frozen meat. <laughs> Looks like a bunch of frozen pigs. That's right. <laughs> so that's kind of how things worked up until roughly the 1950s. Um, every time you wanted to load a ship full of cargo, it was in different size, sizes, whether it was bags or, or, or barrels or containers or crates or boxes or pallets. Um, everything was different size. And it took a lot of time to get that freight loaded on a ship, loaded back off the ship. Maybe it goes onto a truck, gets loaded onto the truck. The truck goes to a different city, gets offloaded off of the truck. That loading and unloading took a long time until this guy came along, a guy by the name of Malcolm McLean. Malcolm McLean was a, started a trucking company in the United States, started out with one truck. Before too long, he had a whole fleet of about 25 trucks, but he always hated waiting at the port for things to get unloaded off of his truck onto the ship or offloaded off the ship onto his truck. And he says, there has to be a better way. And so he came up with what we now know as intermodal containers. Your, your standard 8 foot by 8 foot by 20 foot container. Um, what did this do to the shipping industry? Come on, I said I wanted feedback. I'm, it standardized transportation. It, it really revolutionized shipping. Um, it cut shipping costs by more than 80%. It sped up the, the, you know, the time that you know, things could get you know, unloaded, you know, put onto the ship or offloaded onto a ship and onto a truck or onto a train and vice versa. And it just made things standardized so it was so much easier to do international shipping. To give you an idea... Today, more than 90% of all non-bulk cargo, so if, if you're you know, cutting out things like shipping wheat or coal or things like that that, that just go in big, open, big huge open uh, boxes, about 90% of the world's freight is, is, is shipped in, in containers like this. Um, and they, they estimate that uh, just since 1990 alone, the, the amount of cargo shipped in shipping containers like this has multiplied five times last 25 years. It's growing just, just, just a little bit. So standardization is important. Um, it's amazing now that you can have a container full of T-shirts or shoes or whatever it is, you know, manufactured, let's say, manufactured in China and shipped to the United States, and, you know, 25, 26, 27 days later, it's there, it's unloaded at your front door, and that container's probably never been opened. So it, it's, it's really revolutionized uh, the way shipping shipping it also has manu have, has uh, improved manufacturing there's a lot of companies that get their raw materials in containers like this and the containers will show up within hours of the time they need it for their production and then they ship their products out the door in containers just like that now on the way out so quite quite an interesting story now if you want to read more about it there's a great book called the box by mark <coughs> levinson that is really interesting about you know, t t talking not only about how containers changed the, the shipping industry, but how it changed the world economy as well. I, I suggest you may want to go pick that up. It's a, it's, it's a better read than you'd think. Now, I have a particular interest in, in containers and uh, in offloading and unloading containers onto ships because one of my first IT jobs while I was still going to the university was working for a simulator company. And we built simulators for these gantry cranes. So this is called a gantry. This is the thing that picks up one of those containers. It connects to the top of it. In the corners here, it's got a little mechanism that locks into the top of the container and will lift it. And then you sit up in the cab, clear up in this, this little cab right here, you know, stories and stories and stories in the air, looking down at these containers. You, got, you kind of get this kind of a view, looking down on the containers from the top, picking them up, moving them, or picking them up, setting them on a truck, or putting them from a truck onto the ship, and and that sort of thing. So, so I had a lot of fun, you know, designing simulator systems to do this, and uh, so kind of kind of an interesting uh, passion of mine. Um, but obviously, we know today that there's these big, huge, you know, container ships that that, that carry these these containers around. Some of these container ships will hold fifteen thousand containers. And they keep making bigger and bigger ones all the time. In fact, part of the reason that uh, 
Panama is expanding the size of the Panama Canal is because so they can get bigger and bigger ships to come through the through the Panama Canal. Interesting. So that kind of sets up the, uh, the the story for Docker. Docker is really the shipping container of application virtualization. Now, what do I mean when I say application virtualization? We've probably all heard about virtualization over the past five or ten years, um, whether it's you know, operating system virtualization, um, platform virtualization, application virtualization. The best analogy I can I can give is, you know, is that running an, you know a single set of applications on a single box is kind of like a house, right? It's kind of self-contained. It's got everything a, a family would need. Um, when you get into virtual machines, that's kind of like row houses or townhouses where it's a bunch of houses stacked right next to each other, but they're still pretty much self-contained. They don't have a lot of shared resources between one townhouse and the next. Um, when I'm talking about application virtualization, I'm talking more like an apartment building. There's a lot of shared resources there. There's shared plumbing. There's probably shared you know, electrical hookups. There's probably you know, some other shared utilities along those sorts of things. What that does for the individual you know, apartment owners is, is it reduces their costs, and, and they can share some of those costs with the other, the other people in the apartment building. There's also some drawbacks in, in if, the, you know, if the apartment building catches on fire, who gets to pay for it? Well, everybody does. You, know? you, you share the responsibility as, as well. So the idea behind Docker is to really provide a standardized container for an application that can be easily moved or reproduced from one machine to another. So reproducibility is one of the one of the key key things of Docker. So I want to take just a minute and talk about kind of the architecture or the infrastructure of how Docker works. There's uh, there's there's several foundational pieces that make uh, Docker work and work well. The first thing is is namespaces within the Linux kernel. Uh, we have namespaces for for process IDs, for the network, for interprocess communications, for mount points, for for all kinds of different things in within the, within the Linux kernel. What th this means to an application is it's it thinks that hey, I've got a user with ID 501, and that's great. But in the in in, in the host system, it may be a, a totally different user number. It may have different process IDs. What the, what that container sees is not the the whole world view. It gets kind of a, a, a micro view of what's going on. It sees, you know, its own view of the network, even though on the host machine may have a totally different network, um, that sort of thing. Um, we also leverage what are called control groups in the in the Linux kernel. Who's familiar with control groups? Control groups are pretty cool. They've come out in the last oh, four or five years within the Linux kernel. What that allows you to do is within the kernel say, hey, this this process over here can only use this much memory or can only use this much CPU, or can access this stuff over here but can't access this, this stuff over here. And so it's, it's, it's a very nice way uh, when you're dealing with virtualization of constraining a, a process or a user or, or those sorts of things so that they don't take up all the resources, that they can't take more than their fair share of the resources, whether it's memory or CPU, that sort of thing. Um, Docker also uses the, what's called the union file system, union FS, which makes it easy to kind of layer uh, pieces of the file system on top of each other, and we'll see we'll see more about the layers here in a minute. Um, and then, last but not least, Docker um, came came up with kind of a container um, file system format that they call libcontainer. That it's a standardized format that you could take a, a container from one machine, ship it over to another machine, start that container on that other machine, and, and have your application run up and running very quickly on that other container. Um, so it defaults to using that container format. You can also use another container format out there called LXC that, that's used by the by the Linux kernel. So that's kind of the that's kind of the, the foundational pieces here. Let's see how those fit together. Um, Docker comes with a, a, a Docker uh, host or a Docker uh, daemon, a server. We're going to say that's that's right here. Here's the daemon. Here's here's the machine it's running on. And then there's a Docker client that you can run from the command line to execute commands against that against that host. Now it's kind of neat the way that works. Um, that client talks to the to the Docker host to the Docker daemon using simple REST um, commands. So anybody in here that's done HTTP and done REST kind of calls, um, the command line client is actually calling, making REST calls out to a Unix socket to talk to the to the Docker daemon. You can have the Docker daemon listen on, t on a TCP port if you if you'd rather and communicate across the network. Now one of the drawbacks to that today is that there's no security or authentication or anything on that. So you may, may want to be careful with that if you, if you play with that. Um, that's something that's supposed to be coming hopefully in the near future in Docker in, in, in Docker 1.4, roughly. Um, but the idea is that you, from your client you say, hey, Docker, build, this, build me this container or build me this image. Hey, Docker, pull this, 
this image down from, from some sort of external registry, a, you know, a repository of, of existing images that people have created. Um, hey, run this, run this image and create me a container based on, on this particular image. So these are the, really the, 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 the three pieces you need to know about um, as far as real, real objects you're going to be dealing with are images and containers and registries. So let's go into a little more depth on each of those. An image is a pre-built system. It's a pre-built application um, template, so to speak. Um, and so you may have one for something like Ubuntu, or you may have one for CentOS, or you may have one that's specific, more specific to an application like Nginx. And then what you do is you use a Docker pull command to pull a copy of that image down to your, down to your Docker host, and then you do a Docker run and say, I want a container based on that particular image. So you want to say, hey, I want, a, I want a new Ubuntu image. You say Docker run that image, and it'll create you a new container based on that image. So the image is kind of a read-only template of, of the container, and then you can instantiate as many as containers as you want based on that image. So you may have four or five or six or 200 containers all based on that one Ubuntu image in this example. Does that make sense? The registry, like I said, is just a... Is a, is a place that you can go out and pull existing images that have been created or push your own back up to the repository. Now, the Docker community has one that they call the Docker Hub. That's kind of the central repository for all the Docker images. But you can certainly run your own in your own infrastructure. And I'm going to strongly suggest that you probably want to look into running your own for reasons I'll talk about a little bit later in the, in the slides. But uh, the idea is that, uh, that if you don't already have you know, an image created the way you want or you want to get an updated version, you would go and pull that from the registry. You could you know, create your containers. If you wanted to make changes to that, you could also push it back to the registry if you had the permissions to do so. Any questions up to this point? Not seeing a lot of nodding heads, so I want to make sure people are following along. All right. Now, now's the part where everything goes up in flames because I'm going to skip away from the slides here for a minute and, then, and I'm going to show you some real world examples. And hopefully this works and, and maybe we'll have internet access in the room and that sort of thing and, and we can have fun with that. Sound good? All right. Nothing, like, nothing more dangerous than standing up and doing a demo live, right? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show you is if you run the Docker images command. This is just going to show me the, do the images that I've already downloaded here to my local machine. And so I've got a bunch of them. Is that big enough? Can you guys see that okay? Um, you can see I've got a bunch for Drupal CI, and we'll get into exactly what each one of these does here in a minute when we talk about the Drupal CI piece of this. But just down at the bottom, you notice I've got, for example, I've got Fedora 22. Um, I've also got one called Fedora Latest. I've got one called Hello World. And if I wanted, let's just run that Hello World one. That's, that would be a good example, right? If we wanted to run that, we would just do Docker run hello world and what happened it took that image created a container out of it ran that container all the container just spit out some information and then and then exited the idea of these containers is that they run one application they start that application they live as long as that application runs and when that application stops running the container goes away it's done disappears Okay, so in this case, a Hello World example is pretty trivial. All it does is print some things to the screen and exits, and, and the container is gone. Not that exciting, right? What if we wanted to run a container and, uh, and you know, leave it running in the background and, and, and interact with it, that sort of thing? So let's do that. Let's go ahead, and I'm just going to use one of the ones that comes from Drupal CI since it's, it, it'll be lots of fun. Let's do Docker run Drupal CI MySQL 5.5. I'm going to add a couple of, uh, of options here. Um, first thing I'm going to do is do a minus D to tell it to run in the background, run as a daemon. When I run that, what happens? It just spits out a big long number. Any, any guess as to what that is? Container ID. It's a container ID. It's an identifier so that when we go Docker PS to see what, what containers are running, you'll see that the the beginning of this, that this container ID here is the beginning of that actual long, long hash there. It's a hash of the value, right? Now, I can, by default, each of these um, containers is also going to get a made-up name unless I specifically tell it to, to give it a name. 
So here's here this one's called goofy right. If I created another one, I've got one called elated brown and goofy right. Um, each of these containers you, you you start is going to get its own name, or you can assign your own tag, your own name to that to, if you want to you know give it a, a more useful name than, than than an invented name that that comes from Docker. Um, you can you can see what's going on with one of those containers by doing Docker logs, and you can either give it the name in this case like Goofy Write, or I could give it the the, uh, the 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 container ID or the first several characters of the of, of the container ID, and that would work. And this is telling me what's going on with that uh, in the logs. What happened as that as that container ran? And it looks like if we if we scroll back a little bit, it looks like it started up. Um, it installed some system tables in MySQL. It killed. Some, it filled up some help tables. It printed out some information. We connected. We were unable to connect for some reason here. Jeremy's going to figure out why later. Um, then we were able to connect successfully. We added a user called Drupal Testbot. Some some commands happened. Some some grants. Some permissions were granted. And now MySQL is up and running. Okay. How can we tell that it's up and running? We could, except we didn't tell it. We didn't tell the system how to map the network port inside this container to a network port on our host system. So right now, MySQL is running, but traffic's not going to get to it. So let's kill these off, and then let's start them up by by specifying a port. So again, we can do Docker ps to see what containers are running. Docker kill that one. Docker kill that one. And again, tab completion is a beautiful thing. Um, it just works. So now Docker PS, we're not running anything. Let's go ahead and restart our container here. This time we're going to say connect port. Since I'm already running a local copy of MariaDB on my laptop here on port 3306, let's put this on 13306. How does that sound? And connect that to 3306 on the on MySQL 5.5. Does that make sense? So we're going to tell it that's where that's at. Again, we can do Docker logs, except we don't know the, the ID of the of the container. So Docker PS, ecstatic McLean. Hey, nice that it chose McLean as the name. Remember the, the McLean guy that built the shipping container? That's kind of cool, isn't it? Okay, so now we can say Docker <coughs> logs, ecstatic McLean. He's ecstatic to know I'm talking about him. We see that MySQL is up and running. Let's try to connect. So if we do MySQL... Minus H, 127.0.0. Localhost port, what did I say, 13306? The user is Drupal test bot. And I'm not going to tell you the password. Although it's easy to find. And with any luck here. Duh. Why didn't Should I say that again? I think you can put Office 1336. What you said. Let's find out. Static McLean is what it was. 13306. Hmm. That worked when I tried it, when I was building the slides. Let's try one more time here. It doesn't, doesn't matter with MySQL. Let's try this. Yep, I do it all the time. Let's try that. There we go. And as, as you see, normal standard out of the box MySQL database. So our, the, the container that Drupal CI that we use in Drupal CI, it installs MySQL, it creates that user, it grants permissions to that user, all as part of the container startup. And I'll show you that here in a second when we get into the how does how does Drupal CI use that. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's in a nutshell to show you how, how you can get up and, and started using using Docker. But Docker is no fun to just use if, if you're depending on somebody else's images, right? Let's show you how these things actually get built. So I'm going to log out of here. Um, I'll go ahead and kill that.
container. No more containers running. Okay. So I'm going to start out with a very, very simple example to show you how Docker containers and images get created. Um, typically, when you're creating a new Docker image, you create it by creating a file called Dockerfile. And a Docker file has, has several different parts. I'm going to try to walk through those in a couple of examples here. Um, the, the first thing you'll typically see in a Docker file is a line that begins with from in all capital letters. See that up there? I apologize. It's cutting off the first letter there. That says from, F-R-O-M. And this is saying, what, what base image do we want to start with? In this case, it's saying start with a ba base image of Ubuntu Trusty. Um, you could say Ubuntu Latest. You could say Fedora 23. You could say Fedora Latest. You could say CentOS, whatever, whatever kind of base image you want to start with. Um, but typically, people start with an operating system as their base and, and, and work their way up from there. It kind of makes sense, right? Um, and then um, th there's a, another line that says maintainer. The, the idea of the maintainer line is just put your name in there or some way to recognize, hey, who's responsible for creating this Docker file? Who, who, who should you go yell at if it's broken? Um, the next thing you'll see is, is one or more commands that start with run. These are the things that Docker is going to do to build this particular Docker image. So in this case, it's going to go download the, the Ubuntu image. And then as part of the run command here, it's going to do an app get update app get install Apache 2, app get clean, and remove some temporary files. Okay, so what's that going to do? It's just going to get that machine up to date and make sure Apache's up and running on the box, or installed on the box at least. Um, that's what those run commands. And you can have as many of those run commands as you want, but you want to group things together that belong together. Like everything you're going to do with app get should probably all be as, as part of one command. And, and that's for, for caching reasons. I'll, I'll talk about here in a minute when I talk about the caching layers in Docker. Um, the next thing you, we've got an example of here is the env command. Those are just setting environment variables. So in this case, we're setting an environment variable of what user and group that Apache should run as, um, what's the log directory for Apache, that sort of thing. Uh, the expose command here um, says which port is going to be exposed to the, to, to the host Damon. In this case, we're going to expose port 80. Um, none of the other ports on this machine will be able to be connected to from, from outside of the container. So that's kind of your, your poor man's firewall, for, for lack of a better term. It's a way of, of only exposing the network ports that you really want exposed out to the outside world. And then right here we have CMD, command. And this is the command that's going to run. This is the application that's being you know, containerized. So in this case, it's user bin Apache 2. And then anything after that is just, uh, you know, uh, arguments or, or, or parameters that are passed to that, that command. So in this case, it's running user sbin Apache 2 minus capital D foreground to run Apache in the foreground. When Apache dies, if Apache were to crash for some reason, what's going to happen? The container goes away. It's done. Okay? So whatever you put in your command here is what's going to run and keep running for the life of your container. Question back here. So, so, so the question was: Here, I only specified one port. I only specified port eighty. But when I when I when I instantiate this image. How do I how do I assign that to a port on the on the daemon on the on the on the host right is that your question right, right. Here, for example, you have port here you have another port so you have to like uh, oops always match correctly or you can just randomly assign ports you can even they're not, uh, right so so here is what's exposed here but when you actually take this image and instantiate it into a container then you would map, hey, I want port 8,000 on my local system to map to port 80. Or maybe you have two or three of these running, and maybe you want one on port 8,000 and one on port, port 8,001 and that one on port 8,002. You, do, you create those mappings at the time you create a container. This is just the image that it's going to use to create those containers. But if it's not exposed here, you're not going to be able to map to it when you create the container. Does that make sense? Perfect. All right. Any questions up to this, this point on this Docker file? Not too complicated. Oh, here's a question. Just a, a clarification. Uh -huh. You can have a set of random ports if you just specify one port or set of random ones. 
Yes. And then you can also, if you wanted to expose an importer 80 on your local, you could use 80. 80 colon 80. Yeah, 80 map to 80. Yep, that's correct. Okay, so that's uh, that's a very simple example. Let's let's do a little more in-depth example here to get a, a better feel for, for Docker files. And since I like Postgres, I'm one of these crazy people that runs Drupal on Postgres. Let's uh, jump in and, and, and look at uh, maybe a more a slightly more complex Docker file here. Again, when we're saying from Ubuntu, in this case, just a, another tag out there, 12.04. Um, Again, some, some kind of identifier for the maintainer to see who, who maintains it. We've got some environment variables we've set here. This is just so we can specify what version of Postgres do we want, what's the username and password we're going to create for that user. Um, and then we're going to run this, this set of commands here. Um, we're going to set up some of the, the, the lists for the sources for, for app get. We're going to get the, uh, the public key so we can make sure we're getting something that's been cryptograph cryptographically signed by the Postgres community. We do an app get update to update the system, an app get install Postgres and Postgres contrib for that particular version of Postgres. Um, and then again, clean up after ourselves. Um, that, those, are, those are very similar to what we've seen before, just a little more in, in depth because we're adding a, a, a Debian repository from, from the Postgres community. Um, here's a new command that we haven't seen before called copy. And what that's doing is saying, copy a file called start.sh from my local directory and inject it into that container. Call it start.sh in, inside the container. So that's a way of, if you have configuration files or that sort of thing that you want to copy and have them be inside of the container when the, when the, when the container starts up. Yes, yes, there's a working directory command that you can also use if you want to change into a different working directory before, the, before the, this command runs um, that, that, that you can use. So, so in this case, we're saying, hey, just copy the start.sh file over, um, and then we're going to run, run another command to remove this, this policy.d um, file, and then we're going to actually run that start.sh command that we copied over. Does that make sense? Now, one of the things I want to explain is at each one of these steps here, the way Docker works is it creates a cache of, of each step. So if you run this and you've already got the Ubuntu 12.04 image on your system and it's not going to download it again, it knows, hey, I've got the latest copy. I'm just going to use that and continue on. Then it adds a new layer by just changing the maintainer. And then it adds a new layer for setting the, the environment variables. Run and command. Okay, so run are things that, that get set up to create the image. Command is actually what what command runs when you start the, the, the container. Thanks. Yep, so as each one of these commands executes, whether it's an EMV command or a run command, Docker, when you build that image, it's going to go run that, and then it's going to capture a snapshot of that and create a cached layer of that. So if you had if you had two different Docker files and they were only a couple of lines apart, most of that's going to be cached, and it's really just differences between those those at the end. Similar to how many people here use Git, and you do Git commits, and and, and you see just the differences. It's same same sort of idea here. It's just automatically creating an implicit commit between each of these commands. Which is which is kind of cool. So, and if you want to, you can go back and look at. Let's just do Docker history. Um, let's just look at that uh, MySQL 5.5 container again. Drupal CI MySQL 5.5, and you can see, you know, what 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 were those different commands that happened? What was the size of it? What was the over here? You've got the the image ID, what's, what, what's, what, what was that image, what was the, the identifier of that image at that stage? And you could even roll back and say, hey, I want to roll back to what this was you know, four days ago at this particular stage in the, in the process if you wanted to. So you get these, these layering effects that really help out with caching and, and reducing the amount of, of bandwidth that's needed when you're copying around a bunch of, bunch of machine images. Does that make sense? You could. Yep. So you could try it. Oh, no, that change broke everything. Let me, ro let me roll back. You just do a Docker tag and one of the previous image IDs, and it would just roll back to that 
to that stage, and then you'd go back and fix your Docker file and do another Docker build and rebuild the rebuild the thing. So let's 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 show you what it looks like when you actually build an image from one of these Docker files. Let's go back to our Apache example, just as a, just, just as an example here. And if the internet works, we should be able to do Docker build and the directory where that Docker file is, and it's going to go out there and do those steps. You see, it says step zero. Step one, step two, and you notice it it creates a new a new image ID for each of those steps that it's going to cache. So we'll let that run here for a second. And then we'll run it again to show you, you know, how it's going to use those existing caches. So I'll take it a second to to to, to do its update and install Apache 2. Now it's doing the setup. And just, just by way of information, one of the nice things about containers is I'm not running Ubuntu on my laptop here. I'm running Fedora on my laptop here. But I'm running a, a, a containerized version of Apache that happened to come from Ubuntu. So it makes it very easy to get applications to, you know, cross, across operating systems, across platforms, which is, which is kind of fun. Okay, so that's, that's, that's out there and built. If we did a... Docker images, and if I scroll up to the top, you see now I've got one without a name here that was created 17 seconds ago. That's that's that that one I just created. Now we should probably give it a better name, right? So let's do. Let me grab that image ID, copy that. We'll do a Docker tag. Give it a name. Now when I do Docker images, hey look, it's got a name of J Smith slash HTTPD. Now that's that tag is just a human readable name. You can you can put anything you want there. What really counts is the image ID. I could create three or four tags that all pointed at the same image with different names if I wanted to. That's just that's 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 just a human readable name. Yes. Yes. That's correct. Two containers that are that are that are that are you know file level equivalent should be have the exactly the same tag. Okay, so so that's that's that. Now let's that, now let's go build that again and see what happens. It's done. Why? Because it's got all those different layers cached, and when you do Docker history. On that image, you can see what each of those, or each, what are the, each of those layers are that make that makes that make up that Docker image. Make sense? Question over here. How long is this cache? Because uh, some commands actually yeah, are persistent, like if you are changing uh, file content via stat, but an update update probably fetches new stuff. So I was going to talk about that more when we get into security, but yeah, we can talk about that now. It's updated until you do a Docker, a Docker poll. Oh, I need to repeat the question. Sorry for the recording. So the, the recording was, how long does this get cached? If I do an app get update today, that doesn't mean it's going to be you know, running tomorrow to, to, to get the update. So it, it, it sits there in cache as long as you, until you do a Docker poll or a Docker, do, uh, rebuild your Docker container, your Docker image if you're, if you're building it yourself. Um, in the case of the ones in Docker in, in Drupal CI, we rebuild them every few days. So you see, like, well, these are a little older than that, four weeks ago. But uh, typically every few days we'll do a rebuild, or if we see that there's something that's, that's updated in the upstream um, in the upstream image. And then, then you get to go yell at upstream and say, hey, why isn't your image updated in four weeks? You know, it's, so um, we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about security. But, but the basic idea is this is going to stay cached here until we either rebuild it and it does another app get, and it, says, it sees there's a difference, and so it'll, you know, it'll change that, or you know, until you clear out the cache manually. If you wanted to blow away that image, you could say Docker RMI for remove image. <coughs> and it's going to go remove all the unused layers of that cache. If it sees something is still using one of those layers, it won't remove it because it'll say, yeah, something's still using it, and to, and unless you force it to anyway. Does that make sense?
Okay, so that's uh, that's a little little you know crash and burn demo. Nothing nothing went up in flames too bad. So now let's talk about uh, the uh, the Drupal CI infrastructure and how this plays into everything. Um, I came in a little bit late to the Drupal to CI group and, and, and what they were doing, but I, I learned early on when I just jumped in and started helping out is that they had two really big goals for, for Drupal CI that kind of set it apart from the old test bot system. Um, goal number one was to be able to test a lot of different combinations of, of PHP, different versions of MySQL or MariaDB, even point versions of PHP. Um, maybe, maybe you know, the reason I got involved is because I wanted to test against Postgres. I wanted to get, you know, Postgres support improved in, in Drupal 8. So I was like, I'm going to make it so we can at least test against Postgres. Then we know when it's failing and when it's not, and then we can make it better. So um, so testing across all these combinations, and you kind of get this, this this big, huge matrix of all the different versions of PHP and all the different versions of the databases and and, and that sort of thing, right? Um, one of the other core goals that, that, that the Drupal CI team came up with was that they wanted to make it easier for developers to be able to do their own local testing without setting up a whole, a whole, a whole box or a whole system um, to do testing on, on, on their own system. I like being able to test things right on my laptop. I don't like having to depend on anybody else's infrastructure or the internet or whether Amazon's down today or those sorts of things. Um, I like, you know, maybe it's the Boy Scout in me, but I'd like to be prepared. So, so that, that, that was one of the goals that came out of Drupal CI. And Docker made both of these goals a whole lot easier. So what we did in the Drupal CI community is came up with uh, with uh, kind of a layered approach to our Docker images. We created uh, Docker images, obviously, for the different versions of, of PHP and the different versions of the databases. But we did it in a layered fashion such that we have a, a base image that everything is based off of. Um, beneath that, there's a PHP base for, for the PHP, even for the different versions, so we can you know, instantiate different versions of PHP. Underneath that, there's a web base. Um, and then the, the, the individual versions, web 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, web 7. Yes, we are able to test, uh, test things on, on PHP 7, believe it or not, even before PHP 7 is quite out yet. So that's, that's exciting. Um, and then same thing with the databases. We have a database base image. And then we have MySQL 5.5, MariaDB 5.5, MariaDB 10, Postgres 9.1, and Postgres 9.4. So we can actually go out and test across all those different versions. And if you don't believe me, just yesterday I was sitting in the sprint room and tested a couple of things against both MySQL and Postgres. And look, I could go schedule that test. Oh, I want to test against PHP 7 and MySQL 5.5. It's there today. It works, mostly. <laughs> no, it, it really does work. And it's, and, and it's working surprisingly well. So, so kind of fun stuff. Um, so let's dive in for a second. Let, again, let's get away from the slides and let's actually go dive in to, let's see, I'm going to make that just a little bit bigger so you guys can see. Is that better? So what I've got here is um, I've just checked out the Drupal CI test bot uh, Git repository. Um, so you can see you know, kind of how we've, how we've done things in, in, in Drupal CI with, with Docker. Um, if we go to the containers directory, you'll see that there's a, a base directory, a database directory, and a web directory. Again, the base has all our base Docker uh, images. And so base, base, if we look at the Docker file there, it's uh, pretty straightforward. We'll walk through it quickly. We're, we're going to be based on Ubuntu Trusty. Um, the maintainers, Drupal CI, they're the ones that created this. Um, they've set an environment variable called Debian front end for non-interactive. That just makes app get a whole lot happier knowing it's not waiting for this there for somebody to press yes and acknowledge a bunch of things. Um, it's got a bunch of things commented out here as far as which mirrors to use and whatnot for Ubuntu. We'll skip that for a second. And then all it does is do an app quick, an app get clean, app get update, app get install, unzip, vim tiny, wget, um, does an app get auto remove and an app get clean, and that's that's all that base image does. Just the base, you know, things that we need, we know we need for all the other layers that we're going to build on top of that. So that's pretty straightforward. Oops, if I can type today. If we go to our, um, let's go to our PHP base for a second. Look at that Docker file. It's not too much more, too much more confusing. Again, this time we're we're pulling from Drupal CI base, that previous Docker file that we looked at as the base, and then we're, from there we're adding a second environment variable called home. That's just set to slash root. Um, we go ahead and install a bunch of things that we need to compile PHP. Whee, that's lots of fun. Um, 
We do a Git clone of a project called PHP ENV that lets us set different, you know, which different versions of PHP, which PHP environments we want to build. Um, we go ahead and, and, and make, a, make a small hack to, 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 to make sure it's compiling with more than one core so that it works faster because faster is always better, right? Um, and then we go ahead and build PHP. We install Composer. We install Drush, Supervisor D. We copy some scripts across that we're going to need for later. And then we start running this start.sh that just brings that, brings that environment up and running. Not too complicated, right? And then if we, if we go down the rabbit hole one level deeper and go to our web base, we'll see that it's, it, it's based on the PHP base. We add Apache, a few other things here. Um, we remove the, the PHP 5 CLI version that was in there before because we're going to use this, this, this PHP ENV version that we build ourselves. We, we remove a couple other things here. We copy some, some, some configuration files over for our virtual hosts. Um, we, 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 we modify the Apache configuration to create our virtual hosts and set up, you know, that we're using NPM and uh, enable the, that Drupal virtual host, and that's, that, that's that, that layer right there. Finally, last but not least, we can go into our web directory. Go to web, uh, let's look at 5.6, why not? And we can see that it's based on, the, on that web base that we saw. We enable 5.6.7. We're also, looks like we're installing Mongo and, and APCU and upgrade curl and a few other little things that we need just to make things run nicely. We copy up a bunch of configuration files over, .ini files for PHP, and then we start we run the start.sh, and what the start.sh does is starts Apache with, with the appropriate version of PHP running and, and make sure that that's up and running for us to actually be able to run our tests. So again, it's kind of like this seven-layer burrito dip, right? We've got seven, several different layers here, but they each build on the, on the layer before that. And that, in a nutshell, is what the uh, Drupal CI Docker files look like. Now, just for the fun of it, we'll jump back up here. We'll look at the database just very, very quickly. Um, Show you that there's no tricks up my sleeve. It's just really, really easy. We install MySQL server and Netcat. Remove a few things, clean up, clean up, and that's it. That's that's how terribly difficult it is to create a MySQL image. Again, Does that makes sense. Question. This is well. You showed how it is built by layers, mm -hmm. but when you run it, you run only one Docker. You do you do Docker like if I if I did Docker build on this Docker file, it would pull that DB base image. If it didn't if it wasn't already on my system, it would pull it from the from the repository from from the Docker hub. Okay, what he's asking is, is your whole LAMP stack in one container? Or? No, no, the, the whole LAMP stack is not on one. Is that the, is that your yeah. question? Okay, the LAMP stack is not in one container. Um, we, we, have, we typically have Apache and PHP running in one container, and we have the database running in another container, and then we, then we connect those two containers together. That dependency, does it need that threads on the same container or not? So, yes, this is saying that this, this is our MySQL container, and it depends on, on the database base container. So anything that we added in the database base container would be in this container as well. I think that's the, 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 sorry, the image. I'm using the wrong terminology here. The image. It's like the source repo, mm -hmm. okay. and then the container is actually instant, instantiated in memory. Right. So you download a VM. So, 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 so let me let me take a step back and go back to this slide here. Let me go back to right here. So this image, let's, let's just pick the MySQL 5.5 container, or the image, excuse me, I'm messing up again. The image. The MySQL 5.5 image is just a single image, but it's built on layers that were provided by the database base image and the base image. Okay? So let, let me just show you how that, that works. 
So if we go and say Docker history Drupal CI base, we'll see that that latest version is, and again, it's chopping off the first letter, that 7C8C right there, right? If we do Docker history Drupal CI DB base, you'll see that 7C, 8C, that same image ID is here, and the, the database base just adds one layer on top of that. Okay? And then if we were to look at Docker history, Drupal CI, MySQL 5.5, if we scroll up, we should see right there, 7C, 8C, that, that, that layer there that was the database base, and then the MySQL images just added these layers on top of it, additional commands that were run. Now that creates one image that's MySQL 5.5. You could create as many containers from that image as you want, but that's just one image. Is that, is that clear now? Okay, hopefully I, I start using the right language here. It's hard, you're talking about images and containers and they get messed up in your head. Okay, how are we doing on time? Couple more minutes here. Let's go back to the slides and talk about just a couple couple other things here. Um, so I showed you I sh showed you kind of the, the the code and how it works. You know, Docker files aren't too terribly difficult to learn. Um, troubleshooting them can be uh, a little tricky at times. I think we've gotten pretty good at uh, learning some some interesting and neat ways to do that. Um, we're happy to happy to share those with you offline. Just jump in the Drupal testing IRC channel and and, and ask Jeremy or myself or Ricardo or one of the other guys and. And we'd be able to help you with that. So, so Docker versus Vagrant. Docker versus Vagrant. Yeah. So, so the question is, is why, when would you use Vagrant and when would you use Docker? Um, and when do you use both? Again, we're talking about application you know, virtualization here rather than, than virtual machine, uh, you know, the, the, the machine or, or, or operating system type virtualization. You would use, you would use for, at least for me, I use Docker when I want to have one application that's standalone, that's self-contained, and it's just that application. What I use Vagrant for is spinning up a new virtual machine to test a bunch of pieces of software and how they fit together. And sometimes it may be I fire up Vagrant to fire up a, a virtual machine that pulls in this Docker container and this Docker container and does things across, across both of them. Um, one, one's, you know, Operating system level, you know, virtualization. You're virtualizing the entire operating system, and one you just op you know, you're just virtualizing an application. There is some overlap there, and and it can be confusing and it can be tricky. Especially we'll, we'll talk about security here in a minute. From a security standpoint, uh, you you better understand what you know what layer you're doing your virtualization and how you're going to keep that up. But does that help answer the question? Think, 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 think of think of, of Docker applications like the little Lego blocks, and you're going to stack those together. Typically, you use Vagrant to to make it easy to reproduce a, you know, a kit of those that you can plug together to build something—a a castle or a ship or a, an airplane or whatever whatever you want to build out of Lego blocks. And the aspect is very it varies. It really is. When would you use both? Anytime you're not using Linux. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Boot to Docker is just, for the most part, vagrant. Yeah, yeah. Boot. If you if you're familiar with Boot to Docker, it's just yeah. For all intents and purposes, it's just vagrant. Just just with a different name. All right. Let's give you some warnings here. Um, I don't want you to get too excited about Docker because it's not perfect. It's got some warts. It's got some uh, some soft spots. Um, I'll try to warn you about some of those in the next few minutes before I wrap up here. Um, first of all. If, if when you go and, and, and pull an image from, the, from a registry, if you don't specify a colon and, and what version you want, like you saw, I went out and I pulled um, like Ubuntu colon trusty or Ubuntu colon 12.4. If you don't specify that tag, it's going to default to just pulling whatever the latest version is, which is what we all want, right? <laughs> Until a new version of Ubuntu comes out and our application isn't ready for it, and what happens? Oh, my images don't build anymore. Crud, that's not what I wanted. It also, you know, from a from a security update standpoint, may not be what you want. 
Um, because typically you want reliability. You want, hey, I built this image today and I build this image tomorrow and it's going to be the same except for maybe some security updates, right? But if it goes and pulls the latest version of Ubuntu and it's a completely different version, suddenly you don't have consistency there and then you're wondering, okay, do, do I have the security updates or don't I have the security updates? And, and, and it gets confusing. So I always recommend that you specify um, which specifically which version of a uh, of a you know of a particular image you want. Now the flip side to that is that means you have to go and say, hey, when I want to upgrade to a newer version, you have to go do that manually and rebuild your images. And you know if you're using containers, build off that image. You probably want to restart those containers. Um, but that's you know that, that 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 that's that's security piece number one. The next question, more oh question before I give the big reveal here. So if the image maintainer is not doing their job, then you're still out of luck. You're right. And, that, and that's, that's exactly what I wanted to bring up with this next slide. So Ubuntu Trusty can be some different kind of image in three weeks. It could be. It, it could be. If, if, it's just a name for the image. It's just a name for the image. Now, in the case of the, the Fedora and the Ubuntu images on, on the Docker hub, they're, they're, they're actually official images from those communities. But in general... What's the difference between these two commands up here on the on the slide? <laughs> is there is is there really any difference between these two? Nope. Docker's great and everything if you trust the internet. Do you trust the internet? I can't tell you how many how many open source how many open source projects out there as this that have something like this as their installation instructions. Just trust this shell script. There is a significant difference. The first one runs in a Docker, so it's inside a container, so it becomes The second one runs it actually on your local host. We'll get to that on the next slide. Okay? Docker runs as root. Docker, do, Docker runs as root. Um, anyway, let me talk about this is one more reason why you may want to run your own registry. Just be careful with it, again, because there's no, no authentication on the registries yet. Okay? Next slide. Um, containers aren't bulletproof. In fact, uh, Dan Walsh, the guy at Red Hat who, who, who worked on SE Linux and the big security guy there, um, he's famous for saying containers don't actually contain. Um, it's not all that difficult to break out of a container. Um, sorry, they don't contain. They, they, they kind of isolate somewhat. But if you're in an apartment building, can you punch through the wall and, and, and get to the apartment next door? Yeah, it's possible. So so you want you typically want to use things like SE Linux, SVIRT, um, those, those, those types of security add-ons to the Linux kernel to help provide more isolation between those. Uh, between those. So yes, it is running in a you know in a container, but there's there's a number of ways to break out of containers, which which is unfortunate, but but it's still not bulletproof. All right, point three about security: who's keeping your your, your images up to date? Who's keeping your containers up to date? You could be pulling the latest images, but if you're not restarting your containers based on those newer images, you may have an old version running out there. Um, Docker themselves did a study earlier this year, and they found that over 30% of the, the, the Docker images on the Docker Hub, on their registry, over 30% had serious security problems, whether it was heart bleed, shell shock, you name it. Um, so again... It's nice that these things are out there and available for us to use, but do your homework. Find out whether they're being kept up to date. Make sure you're keeping your stuff up to date. Um, let's not make the Internet a, a more dangerous place out of just, just because this makes it more convenient for us to, to do some work. All right. We've, we've got a couple more minutes for questions, comments, complaints, Rotten Tomatoes. One here and then there. If, and if, if we can get you to step up to the mic for the questions, that means I don't have to repeat, repeat the question and it'll be better for the recording. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, regarding running Docker in production, right? So uh, versus Vagrant, Vagrant, you, you won't probably use Vagrant in production. I hope so, not. <laughs> um, so would you uh, recommend it? Would you do it? And how do you, for example, keep your containers running, right? If you uh, have a standard Apache installation, then all the processes and our, our uh, init systems are there to run it after reboot or whatever. So right. what's the... Um, I, 
use Docker in production, but I use it in a limited fashion in, in, in production. Um, if you've got a lot of Docker containers that you're running and you want orchestration around those, there are open source applications like Kubernetes that are that are specifically built to orchestrate, make sure that they, these things stay up. And if if this container goes down, start up another one. And if this one can't be reached, then start it start it up over here on another pod and those sorts of things. There's there's orchestration pieces. Short of that, if you don't want to go to all that trouble, then I would say you manage it like you do any other application. You monitor it, and if your if your monitoring system tells you they hey Apache isn't it has gone down, then you then you go start. Start, start it back up again. Great. Thank you. But yes, I hope you're not running Vagrant in production because that's not, not, not the right model. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Really good presentation. Really enjoyed it. Yes. This is what I was looking for, um, particularly lo well, the local development environment. That was because I have a Mac. Um, I think Docker runs on a small VM virtual machine. Is, is that right? Now, the thing that interests me is I use um, Vagrant at the moment for local development. And what the biggest problem I've had is the performance, mm -hmm. um, particularly things like if you're doing building Drupal views. And so I was looking for Docker to provide that isolation that you get um, that, that a VM gives you, but, but more lightweight. Does that, does that sound like a, a reasonable approach? or? Yeah, I'm, I'm not yeah. the world's expert on, on Macs. I, as, a, yeah. as a former Fedora project leader, I'm kind of kind of biased towards Linux anyway, so mm -hmm. I run Linux on my machine, and I'm not, it's been a long time since I've used a Mac. But from everybody I've talked to, that's kind of that's So, kinda so running, say, a, a Docker application like your web developer site mm -hmm. on, uh, in a Docker container um, on a Mac is potentially better performance than running that same site in a Vagrant provision VM is that would that be it, it, it really can be because yeah. you're, you're not loading a whole other operating system yeah. on top F finally um, I expect you already know this tool is Kitematic it's a UI on the Mac for building Docker not familiar oh, okay. with it. sorry yeah, that's alright just yeah, wondering what your thoughts not, were but that was great okay. thanks very much super presentation thank you thank you so I was curious how you were bridging. Obviously, you showed uh, on Didato a interface for I want this web version and this uh, DB version, how you're taking that input and then instantiating those actual containers if you're generating a Docker file on the fly that is... It's it's not a, it's not an those. image that combines those two. It's just when we fire up a test bot, it says, hey, start this Docker container, start this Docker container, connect the database here to the to, to the web one here, and then start fire off the tests on the on the web container. Jeremy can give you more details on, on how that works. He knows that system better than I do. But uh, okay, and Jeremy, just raise your hand. So anybody anybody has questions about the test system, Jeremy's your guy. And there's Docker Compose now, which makes that a little easier yes. to wrap that in a YAML file. It is. Um, just a reminder for folks that don't know, we're doing a Docker Tools Throwdown thing, BOF, uh, right after this in one thirty. I think that's what, uh, 345? Right, right over here. So if you're interested in this, if you have more questions about even getting set up with Mac and stuff, we've got people that are, a lot of people that are already using this for local development like myself. So, Cool. Thanks for, thanks for reminding us about that. All right. Any other questions, comments, complaints? I think we've got about 30 seconds left. Hi. Yeah. Uh, you were building your whole LAMP stack in one image. Do you usually do that or build uh, different images for different services? Or Right. So I, I build different images for different s services. So in this case, we had two images. We had one for, the, for, for Apache and PHP. We had one for MySQL or Postgres, whatever the database is. Um, I like to split things out, separate service per image. Cool. If Right. Remember that Docker runs a single process. I'll, I'll, I'll pair it Jeremy here since he doesn't have a microphone. So, that so process is NFD or supervisor? Right. Now, I will, I will say it's bad practice to have, like, supervisor D or, or init as your process that the, doc, uh, that the Docker container is running. That's the whole... I mean, the whole reason of, of, of doing, you know, container or application containerization is because you want to run one single application, not because you want to run a whole internet system and a, and a whole bunch of daemons behind it. So um, typically you want one container per application or one image per, per application, per service. If you do see a container with a full that's the approach that they do it? Yep. It, it, it does happen that way. All right. With that, I, I, I leave, you, leave you with sweet, sweet dreams of walking on the beach at sunset looking at gantry cranes. Yeah, right. <laughs>
take that? Oh yeah, they're 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 right down. They're, they're right. I didn't I didn't take this picture, but it was a picture of of something similar. I think I think it was local here. I'm not I'm not positive, but uh, thank you.